leadership on the Marin Healthcare District Board. I was appointed with Sharon Jackson's resignation last fall and enjoyed working on the board with Hank Simmons. He's also running, he's a retired physician. And by the way, I'm a nurse attorney. I was a nurse for six and a half years, and I've been an attorney for over 24 years. And the rest of the board is Larry Bedard, another retired physician, Jennifer Ranks, who you all know very well, and she's just a terrific chair, and Jamie Cooper, another retired okay, physician. Just one second. Can people hear her? No. 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 Okay. I think it's best if you go up. Should I be using yeah. my? Yeah, yeah sure. Is that better? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. I'll just review briefly. I'm a nurse attorney. I've been on the board now since last fall when Sharon resigned. We have a very, very strong board. Uh, as you likely have read over the years, there used to be a lot of acrimony with Marin General and, and Sutter and allowing some of the politics to creep into running the hospital. But Things have changed. I, I feel like the board, since I've been on it in a, for a year now, and Hank Simmons, who's also running, and we are running as a slave, he could not be here tonight. Um, since I've been on the board, what I've seen is that we have a very strong, dynamic, hardworking, stable, and respectful board. We get a lot of work done. Um, in addition to the board meetings, we are on committees. I serve on the Management, Finance, and Audit Committee with Hank. We also have a lease committee, and there's a lot of work going on. And um, as you all know, um, I'm gonna move back to the past a little bit. We have now gotten rid of Sutter. Um, we've made a very successful transition. Uh, we've, we've showed very strong leadership in um, and you know, going after Southern for the monies that were owed. We've now been ruled as the prevailing party, so we'll be getting millions more back. And we have a lot of work to do. We have the bond measure so we can rebuild the hospital, and then we've got to really work together with the changing face of healthcare. First question from the audience. Are you comfortable with the operating structure of MGH? which sharply limits your role in managing the hospital. What exactly is the board's jurisdiction giving raises to Mr. Domenico? Domenico. That's a two-part question, so yes, I'll please. answer both parts. The first part is the relationship between the Marin General Hospital Board and then the district board. Those are two different boards, and the district very wisely Several years ago, after an in-depth study, chose a group of, of, of experts in hospital operations, finance, health care, to serve on the hospital board to oversee the day-in, day-out operations of the hospital. And as you know, under Title 22 and CMS conditions of participation, each hospital is required to have a governance structure. That serves that governance structure. It also doesn't allow politics to taint the running of the hospital. The hospital is a very complicated business. It's highly regulated. You cannot let politics infuse that. And, and separate from that is the district board, which is the oversight board, and that's what we're on. We oversee the MGH board. They report reports to us on patient safety, equality, revenue, finance, and we have that oversight function. What was the second question? I can answer part B now. Yeah, so the second yeah, question. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. With respect to Mr. Uh, Lee Domenico's salary, CEOs of hospitals are paid based on comparable CEO salaries. This is just not pie in the sky kind of stuff that I think has been alleged by some folks out in the community who are running but are not here tonight, that being Joe Salama. So, so you know, that is the amount of money. It's not a secret. It's, it's transparent what he's compensated, and that's fair. That's exactly what other CEOs are compensated, and that's what it takes to run a very complicated and to make that hospital successful. What is that amount again? 
I believe 600,000 plus with benefits. It's a bargain. So the next big thing is the bond measure. That's the thing that I, I've seen um, the road show a couple of times myself personally. So with the bond measure, can you explain a little bit more to the crowd how the bond measure, what the plan is to, <laughs> what, to use with the money? And this is probably going to take more than the minute. I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> I will. So as you all know, we need to rebuild the hospital. It's part of the seismic safety requirements. It's a 60-year-old hospital. It needs to be brought up to date. And so what happens is we have a bond measure. The taxpayers need to vote on that. I believe we need to raise 500 by the taxpayers, and the hospital raises 300 million, or that could be the reverse. But it's essential that we get out the vote to get that passed so we can rebuild the hospital because we need a hospital for the future. And we need a hospital that we can also modernize, you know, in the next 30 years as well. So it's a very key um, point to consider. And actually, that's part of our campaign right now. It's not just to elect Hank and to elect me, but to elect us so we can work with this strong unified board to get the bond measure passed and rebuild the hospital. Can you expand on uh, the, uh, the, the legal battle with the uh, Sutter Health? Uh, do you expect to see the money? Okay. Of course. Um, and everyone knows that we were owed far more. I was, um, you know, I've been an attorney for a long time, so I know how it works. And when you're in an arbitration, you know, generally the arbitrator splits a baby. You're never going to prevail 100%. Um, the uh, arbitrator did not want to rule that the hospital breached its fiduciary duty uh, to the board and, and um, that Sutter did not breach its fiduciary duty because she did not want to set precedent from out-of-state out law. So that she, essentially that's it. But she did say that Sutter willfully breached the contract. So we did get the monies that we were owed, not all of them, but we will get at least three to five million in attorney's fees as well. This question's from the audience. What does the Marin Healthcare District Board do? And what is the board's mission or call? Again, somewhat of a two-part question. What we do, we are the oversight board, as I explained before, for the hospital board. We do not micromanage. We do expect and receive reports from the hospital board on revenue stream, finances, patient safety, quality, all the data that we need to see to know that this is a healthy hospital from a financial and a patient safety and quality perspective. That's what we do. Second, we are also responsible for providing health care for all the residents of Marin. So it's not just about the hospital. It's also about all of the Marin residents and their access to health care. Okay. And then what was the second part of the question? What is the board's mission or call? That's our mission or call, is to provide patients in Marin County with health care and access to health care. One more. One more? Okay. Um, so my understanding is, and I may be wrong, I'm a Kaiser member, um, so I don't go to Marin so County. So am I. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ironic. Um, so I have done spend much time at Marin General. Is there a helipad? And if there's not, will there be one? And I'm also a Kaiser member, and just so you know, from my background, I was a nurse at Kaiser, and I was an attorney at Kaiser, and I received my care at Kaiser. And part of this is not just a Marin versus a Sutter or a Kaiser. We all are, should be working together to ensure a good, strong network for all the residents in Marin. But I just know this historically, is that, yes, they should have had a helipad because they're a trauma center at a certain level, but the neighbors, voiced opposition. I'm not sure where that is now. Quite frankly, I come from a very strong background in healthcare, in which hospitals I work with as a nurse, we had a health path, and we should have one. So that our, you know, we can um, be flown out to, you know, really the tertiary centers is needed. Uh, why don't you just give a one minute uh, closing okay. statement? 
In, in closing, I, I, I do bring unique qualities. Having worked as a healthcare attorney now for close to 24 years, I am currently Deputy Campus Counsel for UCSF for the Medical Center and the campus. And I'm also have the nursing background. I work from on all the issues. I have a very um, deep knowledge base of the wide array of issues that hospitals face now, from the clinical operations to the revenue stream to fraud and abuse and how you get yourself into trouble with the government, um, with False Claims Act liability and such. And um, also with PAPACA, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act that Jared was referencing, also known as health care reform, and the changing environment I'm working on matters now with accountable care collaborations. The health care reform will, will require new ways of delivering health care and being reimbursed. I work on that day in, day out, and I think I can really help the future of Marin General with the changing health care as well as get the new hospital built and work well with the board, and I think it's important that you elect us. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Michael, why don't you introduce yourself and uh, give your two minutes opening statement and then Mark will. Sure. Um, uh, I'm Assembly Member Michael Allen. I serve presently as the Assistant Majority Leader in the Assembly. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that I am the endorsed candidate uh, for the Democratic Party. Uh, I won that through the endorsement process by getting endorsed by the delegates both in Marin and Sonoma counties. Uh, very proud of the fact that um, I have the endorsement of the Sierra Club, League of Conservation Voters. Uh, a few days ago, I was notified that uh, Jared Huffman uh, has chosen to endorse me. I'm very proud of that. Um, I think the most salient factor is that um, the folks who decided to endorse me, folks like Susan Adams and members of the Board of Supervisors from Marin and Sonoma County, uh, feel that um, I, because of my experience and background in, in uh, problem resolution, uh, dispute resolution, that I uh, am best suited to serve the uh, residents of uh, Renton and Sonoma counties. And um, I, I know that but because of my um, 40 years of, of living and working in both Sonoma and Renton counties, that I understand the values of the area, the importance of protection of the environment, and protection of those things uh, that we, we care about. So um, I'm very honored to serve presently in the legislature, and I look forward to serving you in the future. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us this evening. I'm Mark Levine. I actually serve on the city council here and in this council chamber. Um, it's a wonderful community that we live in. I'm running uh, because, quite frankly, um, I look at the challenges facing our state, and I see that we need practical solutions. And as an innovator and a problem solver, I've seen what we've been able to do at that local level. We've pushed forward on clean energy, zero waste, actually balancing budgets on time here at the city of San Rafael during very difficult periods, working collaboratively with, collaboratively with my council colleagues across the county, and in fact, or across the district on issues like sustainable pension reform. We've actually gotten things done at the local level. Things that we see people at the, in the state legislature struggling so hard with. And I think that we can bring that problem solving and innovation to the state capitol. Having the local perspective I have, living here, raising my family, knowing our community as I do, uh, I'm actually able to bring that voice, that local voice to Sacramento that we need so much during this difficult time. That authentic voice that will actually rise above all of the chaos in Sacramento of the special interest to make sure that actual residents have their concerns addressed. Being that local voice uh, is something that will allow us to break the broken political culture in Sacramento, where there's just a complete lack of openness and process and transpar excuse me, transparency taking place. We see how much they struggle just to meet balancing the budget on time, which the voters have asked for. In fact, uh, we see how difficult it is to engage in significant reforms for our state that give voters hope and faith in, in, in the state legislature so that they'll then be empowered to do the work that we care so much about, providing the social services we care about, the education we care about, the environmental protections that we care about. 
I'm very proud of the career that I've had in the technology sector and specifically in human rights and technology and know that with that background I have, I can represent our values in the state legislature. Thank you. Okay, the first question is, what ways do you support or what ways do you suggest uh, for getting our state's fiscal house in order once and for all? Is there still too much bloat in Sacramento? Uh, Mark, you can answer first. How much time do I have for this question? Sorry. Uh, one minute. One minute, yeah. The, the most significant challenge facing Sacramento on the budget issue is actually the lack of trust voters have in the state legislature. And there's no wonder there's that concern. You know, with the debacle of the state park scandal, which is really just out of anyone's control, it seems, there's, there's no wonder that they're behaving that way when even in the state legislature they were hiding their office budget spending. A, a judge had to compel the legislature to show their, those budgets. Um, you know, while uh, employees were being furloughed up and down the state, political aides were getting pay raises. So voters don't trust Sacramento to spend the money properly. And when the legislature and the governor are going out and asking people to pass Prop 30, and I think in this district Prop 30 will pass, but I'm very concerned about other parts of the state that have lost that trust in Sacramento. We need to go out and work directly with the voters in this district, but also with our colleagues' districts to show just how seriously we take rebuilding trust uh, with them. Once voters trust Sacramento again, we'll probably be able to have the revenues necessary to support the issues and um, services we care so much about. Yes, uh, in, the, in the last um, 10 years, you know, right now we're, we're budgeting uh, the way we did in the 1990s for California. We've cut billions of dollars out of the state budget. We're operating about 30 billion below what uh, we would be operating on if you just factored in normal cost of living. Uh, there are always going to be economies being made. I, th I think Governor Brown rightfully deserves a, a, a reputation for frugality. I think that uh, in state government, we've taken the challenge very seriously. I'm very proud to have led uh, uh, and worked with the conference committee to deliver, uh, our, in our estimation, somewhere in the neighborhood of 75 billion to 100 million billion, excuse me, maybe more, of uh, pension savings to pension reform. We're cutting uh, back on double dipping, to pension spiking. We've changed the age requirements. And basically, we did that to get California's uh, fiscal house in order and to essentially try to make sure that we have the money for, to keep the promises to our present workforce, but also to keep the promise uh, for the workforce in the future. And any money we do save allows us to use it for the areas of things we care about in, in our society. This one's from the audience. It says, this assembly seat is known as the most environmentally progressive seat in California. What support do you have that shows your environmental credentials and how will you ensure that big box developers don't ruin our natural resources? Uh, I'll answer that. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that uh, early in my career I litigated for the Sierra Club when I first got out of law school. I do enjoy the uh, Sierra Club endorsement, League of Conservation Voters, uh, Clean, Clean Water Coalition, uh, and I'm part of the Environmental Caucus uh, in Sacramento. I'm also very proud that I worked closely with Jared to uh, bring forward legislation that will have a moratorium on closure of our state parks for the next two years. Uh, I feel that um, uh, the most important thing you can do as a legislator is provide clean air and clean water for our, our public and for our children. And I feel that uh, that is the reason I've enjoyed the support of almost every uh, uh, environmental uh, group in the state and locally. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that we're an environmental district, and I'm very proud of what we've done here in San Rafael, the first climate change action plan in the county. Um, in, in, we have the greenest building standards probably in the nation that started here in San Rafael. Um, you know, on a, a big box project, I imposed a value that I thought was very important, which was making the state's renewable portfolio for clean energy. So in everything that we do, we need to make sure that in operating in our district, people are imbued with the values that we share if they want to be here. And if they don't want to share those values, they don't have to, and maybe they don't have to be here as well. But we have, you know, there's no doubt that there's a circling of the wagons around Michael Allen. There's been a lot of pressure on many groups to be supportive of him. But when you look at individuals who have been leaders on conservation in our, in, in our district and in Marin, for example, like Doug Ferguson, who stopped him on a cello, 
from being Murray Cello from being built and the founder of Sly Ranch, or Gordon Muir, the great great grandson of John Muir, who are supporting me. We have individuals who share our values and are there, but are not tied to the interests in Sacramento, uh, who are there to support me that share our values. Thank you. Tuition and fees at state colleges and universities are going up exponentially. What do you, pro do you propose to do to make colleges more affordable? I'll answer that. Um, you want to go ahead? And uh, uh, are we in an order or not? Oh, order? I think, yeah. Uh, we are alternating, so we are. Sorry. it's Mark's turn. Yeah, when I was in college, I was the chairman of the California State Student Association. And one of the things that we argued for and, and advocated for, and this was during a period of what I call Pete Wilson austerity in the 90s, was that when there are tuition increases, fee increases, that a third of those increases go to scholarships. And we won that battle, and it's continued there. And of course, that's almost 20 years ago, and I've got a bald spot in the back of my head now, I'm a little bit older, but that connection to higher ed is something that I still have. I've worked for a couple of higher ed institutions. When I talk to Democratic parents or Republican parents, they all care about making sure there's a place for their kids to go to college. We've eliminated those spaces in the current budget for qualified students to go to, to CSU and the UC. It's been a huge mistake because that's an economic driver and a driver of innovation for California. We need to make sure that's better funded. Yes, one of the things I worked hardest on this last legislative session was uh, a, a bill known as the Middle Class Scholarship Act, AB 1500, which would have taken uh, tuition down for middle class kids by two thirds reduction, both for the UC system and for the state colleges. We were able to get two votes of Republicans in the assembly, but when it got to the Senate, we were not able to get the two votes we needed from, from the Senate. Uh, it's my feeling that by closing tax loopholes, what are known as tax expenditures, we can find funding to basically reduce the cost of college education. I personally have put my five children through college. I'm very proud of them. I know how important education is. So we absolutely have to find ways to help the folks who are caught in the middle. The, the folks with lower income have Pell Grants and other ways to assist, but the middle class kids are really suffering in their families and we need to find a way to help them. There is a question from the audience about your transparencies in your uh, uh, campaign financing and, and that. Can you uh, give us uh, your Try to clarify that for us. Huh? How can we trust you if you can't be transparent about your personal finances? It's for both candidates. Required correct. by the law. That question's for both candidates. Yes. Uh, yes. Well, it's directed for yeah. one candidate, but, but it's for both. So how can it be worded for both candidates? Yeah, are, are you transparent with your personal finances in your campaign? Since I'm like, the panel will go first, I'll go first. Well, it's, it's your turn. Oh, okay, that's fine. I mean, if you'd like me to, if you're, if you're afraid to answer this question. Please, please, Mr. Levine. Uh, basically, I've been totally transparent in divulging my, my income. It's been an, on all of my reports, but the campaign contributions are online and reportable. I have no problem with, with uh, the uh, campaign reporting in terms of uh, any problems with the FPPC in this regard. And uh, so uh, I'm also a big supporter of the California Disclose Act, which would essentially in, uh, increase transparency and in, uh, in campaign financing. So I feel like I have a very good record in this area. Yeah, I think the point from the question is, uh, I did make a paperwork error. Uh, reporting spousal income is different from your own income. I fixed that and I told the FPPC that before they even investigated it because I realized what that mistake was. Um, but if you're gonna talk about supporting the Disclose Act, you know, there were two hit pieces in the primary that said that I laid off City Hall employees to put TV sets in my City Hall office. Well, welcome to City Hall, Michael. I don't have a City Hall office here. The week after he, that hit piece came out, Michael took the maximum contributions from those organizations that funded the hit pieces. So to say in one breath that you support the Disclose Act, but then on the other hand, I mean these were just ridiculous claims, and on the other hand, accept the maximum contributions from these special interests that push these lies on our community. And I think everyone, everyone can agree that, that, that it's just not believable. Um, 
is, is just un unfortunate to try to push that. To move here to San Rafael and disparage a council member like that is unfortunate. Well, Mark, uh, your hit pieces were in your okay. literature. I, we, we don't have debate that are important. All right. You can save it for your closing statement. So, how can the legislature I have an echo. How can the legislature help create jobs that pay well and provide benefits? And then the second part of that is, do you have support of labor unions, including the state municipal employees union? Um, do you want to go or is it my turn? I think it's Mark's turn. Yeah, it's my turn. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think we really need to invest in education. If you look at the unemployment rates, you've got double-digit unemployment throughout the state of California. But when you look at those with college degrees, it's only 4% unemployment. It's an, a, a significant difference. And so that's college degrees. But you also have to look at early education. When children test above proficient in the second grade, that is a high mark for future college graduation. And if they test below above proficient in second grade, they're unfortunately playing catch up through the rest of their time in K-12 to see if they will have that progress toward a college degree. So funding early education, highly critical for our economy, and of course making sure that once those students graduate and there is a place for them to, uh, to go to college and get that college degree, that they will have high paying jobs and they'll actually be employed during economic recessions as we've seen now. Again, only 4% for those with degrees. It's, it's incredibly significant. What made California great? We have the blueprint that happened after um, World War II during the 50s and 60s where we invested heavily in education and uh, provided uh, uh, an infrastructure where uh, any um, young person who wanted to call, go to college could go to college. Anybody who wanted a technical education could get that education. Uh, he provided excellent public uh, education. Uh, we also invested heavily in infrastructure in terms of our water systems, our roads, all the things that uh, basically society depends upon in order to function. So essentially that blueprint needs to be replicated by investing in education, moving forward with, with the sort of projects uh, that uh, will put people back to work. Uh, uh, I, was, uh, I did agree with Governor Brown and did support high-speed rail. I do think we need alternative modes of transportation. And I think uh, uh, I've also received uh, the support of the small business community and regarding labor unions, absolutely. I'm very proud of the fact that I have the support of, of teachers, firefighters, law enforcement, and almost all organized labor. Uh, going back to the question about uh, helping to create jobs that pay well and provide benefits, um, everybody talks about you know getting a college education and all of that, but let's be real. I mean, a lot of the jobs that are in California and everywhere are service jobs, and there's a lot of blue collar jobs and things like that that don't require uh, necessarily going to college or getting a four-year degree, um, how can we ensure that those jobs pay well and also provide benefits? A lot of these uh, big box stores, um, what I'm hearing is that, um, I mean, I, I know friends, for instance, that have children um, right out of school. They don't know what they want to do. They work for uh, some of these, these stores, and they get 20 hours or less um, a week jobs, and they're they don't get a regular schedule, so they can't work a second job, and they can't uh, they can't plan to go to college either and get regular schedules. So, so those are the people that I'm really concerned about in terms of um, fairness of pay, fairness of benefits, and fairness to uh, continue to grow. Um, all I can tell you is that I was one of the founders of the Living Wage Movement. In Sonoma County. I, I work very closely with also Go Local. I'm a great believer that um, small local business is the best uh, creator of, of jobs, well paying jobs. I do believe that we have in this country what is known as a race to the bottom. And I think what we have to do is to essentially um, try to do whatever we can to help uh, small employers, small business, and also um, those sectors of the, of the, of the um, economy to provide a decent uh, minimum wage, which is nowhere right now near a living wage, and, and benefits as well. So I think also part of the solution is to, to work for universal health care as well, so that people need, besides a decent wage, they need health care.
Yeah, the economy, if you look at it right now, and this is probably the worst time that anyone's got in recent memory or going all the way back to the Great Depression, it's a very difficult time. It's a very scary time for so many families, particularly those later in life trying to figure out how to make it by, um, and also at the same time hoping that their children have an opportunity too. Um, I am proud to be endorsed by the California State Business Association. It's called California Small Business Association as well as the Santa Fe Chamber of Commerce because I've worked with our small businesses and understand those challenges. We, we need to, um, you know, as I mentioned before, invest in education. Um, whether you graduate with a, a college degree or, or just a high school diploma, a lot of students don't know about the job opportunities that are out there for them or the opportunities to be entrepreneurial and create their own career. And if you had asked me when I was in high school, or even if I was in college, that one day I was going to develop software used to monitor human rights abuses, and I'd be trekking across Sri Lanka or Nigeria, helping grassroots non-governmental organizations monitor human rights abuse, I would have been floored. I never could have imagined that that type of job would be available to me. Um, but I was able to make something like that happen. Um, and I think that there are opportunities out there if we're able to make sure that people have the proper education to get there. Transportation is very big in this, in this district, in Marin and, and Sonoma County. And a lot of people use Highway 37. And there was just a report out that rising sea levels will take that freeway away from us, which is going to devastate a lot of traffic uh, to the Central Valley. What would you do to uh, uh, either uh, support a... Uh, a raised elevated elevated structure for that or what plans do you have to alleviate that problem yeah that's a great question and uh, and particularly if we're driving to Sacramento to, to get to the capital for work we're gonna be on 37 a lot um, I serve on the BCBC Commission um, and uh, you know what we've seen in the past uh, few decades since it was created was that we've actually reclaimed more of the bay for water than we had before its creation. It's amazing that we've been able to do that after so much of it had been filled in. If you go to the Lawrence Hall of Science, they have a wonderful display of what you can see the bay look, looked like 10,000 years ago and what it looks like today um, and how it had changed. But one thing that the Sonoma Land Trust is doing that's fascinating to me is it's reclaiming a lot of land for marshland that can become wet, that can stop flooding, um, that is actually very good for the biodiversity and, and, and the environment as well. Uh, and this might stop this concern about whether or not, not 37 would be inundated with flooding completely because this new marshland that will be reclaimed will be doing its job for us uh, and of course is also very good for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Yes, uh, I've been a big supporter of AB32 and California's efforts to, to deal with greenhouse uh, gases and uh, global climate change. As, we, as was discussed with the Sausalito City Council, we're, we're, we, we in California alone are not going to stop global warming and climate change and the rise of the oceans. But um, uh, I was no, one of the legislators that did propose a um, statewide study of the effects of global warming and uh, sea level rise. I do think that what Mark is suggesting about uh, providing for more uh, tidal marsh, uh, dikes, whatever, to uh, stop the saltwater intrusion uh, may well be a good idea, but uh, essentially we're going to have to find a way to protect uh, Highway 37, obviously, because it's, it's a major uh, highway uh, thoroughfare, and so um, I, I suspect that uh, that's part of the long-term planning we're going to have to do uh, all around the Bay Area, just not with 37, but with a lot of other our, of our public assets. Could you describe your commitment to supporting local public schools? Do your kids attend public schools or did they? I think we start with you. Yeah, I'll fly with my going to uh, an independent school uh, that my wife graduated from and actually works at now today. I mean, part of being local is that your wife works at the same school she went to as a kid. It's pretty incredible, and now my son gets the same opportunity to go to school with her uh, each day. And uh, I'm very proud of him and, of course, my remarkable wife who's uh, done a wonderful job with our kids. Question from the audience. Um, have you publicly endorsed Proposition 37? Why or why not? 
I, I'm, I'm a, a sponsor of Proposition 37. I supported it very early on in the process. Uh, yes, I do. Or can you explain what it is then? Proposition 37 is essentially the right to know as to uh, your, your food products, as to whether they've been genetically modified, a labeling notice. So it's, I think the simplest way to describe it is the transparency uh, and notification requirements so that you know the way that you're feeding yourself and your family, what, whether the, those uh, uh, food products have been genetically modified. Yeah, when my wife and I had our children, we decided pretty much on the spot that we were going to be buying organic milk for the rest of our lives. And it's a kind of a no-brainer that you want to know what you're taking into your body and what your children are getting. And so we just started adopting those very same practices for ourselves. Um, I think we have this wonderful uh, acknowledgement and appreciation for the agricultural bounty of the North Bay. And I want to talk about milk. You know, 25% of the Bay Area's dairy comes from West Marin and Sonoma. Uh, and I think our leadership um, in this area is something that we can be very proud of uh, it, as its impact is, you know, across the entire Bay, but a very significant part of our economy and our organic dairymen uh, in particular have been leaders in this area, not just on uh, their, the organic for their dairy, but also in energy production and methane capture uh, at their dairies. So, so back to the question, have each of you publicly endorsed Proposition 37? Uh, I support it. I don't know if I've actually supported it, uh, gone online and, and done it. There are a number of initiatives, so I think there are 11 this time that, uh, you know. I was just asking. Yeah, sure, there. thank you. Do we have time for one more? Any more questions? Oh, we have we lots have one more. more. Yeah, we've got a couple more minutes. Okay. Uh, similar to the Sausalito City Council question, can each candidate mention some of their accomplishments in their current positions? Yeah, I'd be glad to. I think the biggest challenge that we have at the state level is something that I recognized when I first got elected. In fact, on election night, uh, the mayor who served for 24 years came to me and said, Mark, congratulations, and we have to cut the budget. We embarked on uh, public hearings throughout our city to gauge what community support was for where the cuts would need to be. We made some very difficult choices, um, but balancing the budget every year has been a challenge. Of course, we don't know what the state will do every year to take more money away from our local communities, our schools as well. And so we've been very impacted by that. Uh, as much as we've tried to protect and preserve those local funds, the state continues to find a way to take them. Um, but we've done a lot of other things, advancing on climate change, the stringent green building codes that I mentioned as well. Just this week, or on Tuesday, I sat in this seat presiding at our city council meeting uh, because the mayor was out of town and we passed a resolution uh, to ban alka pops. I was so proud to, to support the children who were opposed to those alka pops. It was two years ago that I voted against a liquor license in an oversaturated part of our community. Um, and it was great to see those kids two years later continue to push on that issue. Yes, uh, uh, some of the things I've worked on uh, that I'm very proud of is the fact that uh, I've been put in charge of the oversight for our state um, mental uh, hospitals where we essentially have had a huge problem. And uh, I've been able to gather uh, unanimous support from both Republicans and Democrats on the issue of safe safety for patients and for the staff. I'm very proud of the fact that I was uh, the floor leader during the debate and helpful in getting the votes to get the Homeowners Bill of Rights through uh, the Kamala Harris had been pushing, and uh, I was proud of my leadership on that. Proud of the breastfeeding bill that I just got uh, through to the governor's desk that basically would guarantee that right uh, in the workplace. Um, very proud of the fact that um, we um, have uh, worked collaboratively with the governor to essentially uh, uh, really stabilize California. Just today, uh, we there's notification that the bond rating of California is now going to be getting an upward push to the positive because of the work I did on pension reform. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll just have a one minute state closing statement. We'll start with Mark. Yeah, thank you again so much for joining us tonight. Um, the issues that we've talked about are important. Making sure our district is well represented is critical uh, to make sure that we have a voice in Sacramento and to make sure that Sacramento is working to where it should be working so that we can regain the trust of voters. A lot of us were asked not to run in this race. Michael Allen moved 45 miles to San Rafael to run in this district. I was threatened that a million dollars would be spent against me. 
They did spend nearly a million dollars, and yet we won in Marin County. Michael Allen was held at 30% throughout the district. We have a choice here. We have a local choice in this race. We don't have to take business as usual from Sacramento. We need to work harder in Sacramento. Democrats need to look Democrats in the eye and say, we can do better. The last time Michael Allen stepped inside a city hall in Santa Rosa, he was paid to lobby uh, for $100,000 on a land use change while he was working for the state senate. We can't have that type of ethical lapses occurring and representing us. If Jared Huffman's district director did that, would we be happy about it? Not one bit. The fact that we're taking business as usual from Sacramento in this example is wrong. Thank you very much for your support. Um, it's really sad that through this entire debate uh, tonight and in all the debates we had, my opponent has chosen to go on the negative path. He attacks, he attacks the institution he wants to join. He wants to be in the legislature. He's attacked me. He basically takes things off the blogs and slanders me in such a way as that um, to, to see they're true. Essentially, through this entire process, I've asked my opponent to keep it positive, stay focused on the issues that Californians care about. If you look to the people who have endorsed me, you've trusted them. When he indicts the legislature, he's indicting Jared Huffman. And Jared Huffman has done a wonderful job in this area. We are capable of doing much more. I'm proud of my record of 40 years achievement. And frankly, moving here to San Rafael is my way of showing this district that I'm committed to you. I've lived in Marin and Sonoma County working with all of you for 40 years, longer than you've been alive. And I'm proud of the fact that I'm not some sort of foreigner. I'm, I'm really part of this community, no matter what you say. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so you, gentlemen, you're free to leave. <laughs> and uh, members, we hope you will stay for the caucus. If you do have to turn in your ballot early, Greg and uh, Carol. Carol? Thank you. Yeah, the lady waving her hand. There's two people who will collect that.